Three syllables, tap lines, listener. King of beers. Super Bowl. Commercial. I guess that's nine, actually. <laughs> this will make sense in a second, I promise. In 1994, the mighty pre-InBev Anheuser-Busch made a somewhat shocking decision to do a comedic ad for its flagship brand. A uh, Hugh Moore Spa, if you will. This was a big deal. Up until then, Budweiser's ads hewed to the heartland with sincere, wholesome Americana themes and tunes. The Clydesdales, after all, were no joke. But by the mid-90s, the winds of change were whipping through St. Louis. Bud Light, introduced in 1982, was surging on the back of a super successful Spuds McKenzie campaign, and the powers that be at ABHQ were more amenable to the idea of maybe lightening up the flagship brand's advertising a little bit. So when the firm's longtime hometown ad agency came up with an idea for Bud in 1994 that called for animatronic frogs, August Bush III didn't laugh them out of his office. He gave them the green light. Thus began the production process for one of Adweek's most iconic alcohol ads of all time, built on the strength of just three simple syllables. You know the ones. Bud. Why. Sir. <laughs> okay, I'm not very good at it, but today on Taplines we have someone who is. Tom Woodard. These days, he's the creative director of Nashville's On the Avenue, a training studio space for creative Tennesseans with disabilities. But in 1994, he was writing jingles just outside of town when he got a call from some advertising colleagues. Could he put together a voiceover demo of what it'd sound like if three bullfrogs croaked out the, the name of the world's most famous beer brand? Tom could, and he did croaking his way into the annals of American advertising history as the literal voice of Bud in the King of Beers instant classic 1995 Super Bowl ad. In the episode you're about to hear, we're going to talk about that, how it came to be, what happened after it hit the air, and so much more. It's the voice of Bud, Tom Woodard. It's Budweiser, of course. It's behind the scenes with the most famous frogs in the beer business. And it's all right here, right now, on Vine Pairs Tap Lines. Prepare your ears, Tap Lines listeners. We have a famous voice joining us here in Tap Lines Virtual HQ. It's Tom Woodard, better known as the voice of Bud. Tom, welcome to the show. Dave, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I, I, for those that are still alive uh, when the spot was done, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're, we're having this conversation. A lot of fun. <laughs> Tom, we're so glad to have you. Where are you joining us from today? Yeah, I, uh, I I live in Nashville, Tennessee, with my wife and and son and uh, daughters and grandkids, and um, so hail hail as a native Nashvilleian. Welcome, welcome, and I'm sure Nashvilleians far and wide will be thrilled to have you uh, here on the show today. As are students, scholars, and enthusiasts of the American beer industry. As I mentioned, you're the voice of Bud, and for those who don't know. Quite what I'm talking about, uh, gosh, the voice of Bud. I mean, Bud's had a million commercials. No, no, no. I mean the guy who said Bud in one of the most famous Budweiser commercials that has ever aired, 1995's Budweiser Frogs Super Bowl spot. Um, we're going to get into that spot and your involvement in it and its impact over the course of this episode. I'm thrilled. I can't. I'm, I cannot wait. I'm brimming with excitement. Uh, but Tom, before we do that, you, uh, you're the, the creative director and the, the founder of On the Avenue there in Nashville. Um, your work does not just span the beer industry these days. What, what is it that you're doing these days? Get a little plug in here for the work you're doing these days. Yeah, dude. Thanks for letting me do that. Um, uh, Gotta I, do I, it. I, uh, we built a little place called On the Avenue, um, that, uh, gives people with disability, all kinds of disabilities, the opportunity to use creativity to build community and confidence. Uh, that's really the, the, uh, the idea there. Um, if you're interested in more about it, it's at ontheavenue.net. Or if you're interested in supporting us, great plug here, uh, go to ontheavenuefoundation.org. Uh, and um, it's really a cool uh, situation we've got going in, in a 6,000 square foot studio here in Nashville. Hell yeah. So go check that out, folks. Uh, if you're interested in, in learning more, uh, on what Tom is up to these days. Now, Tom, 
it's time, as we do with all our guests here on Tap Lines, to, to fire up the Tap Lines time machine. We are going to go back to uh, the mid-90s. Uh, we'll set the date to, uh, gosh, I guess let's go to the years 1994, you know, right before, you know, sort of uh, this Budweiser Frogs ad uh, hits, hits the airwaves in early 1995. Tom, you get the call, uh, Budweiser Frogs isn't yet a thing, but it's starting to gestate, right? There's the wheels are turning. And, and, you know, I think it would be useful for those folks outside of the beer industry, outside of the ad uh, space to understand how this type of campaign comes to be. When, when do you first get involved in what would become this iconic ad? Yeah, it's weird. I was in the jingle business, so we wrote music and, and did audio for radio and TV commercials all over the country and had done a lot of work with Budweiser. And so I would say late 94, it was probably, it's been a long time, but late 94, September, we got a call uh, from Michael Smith and Dave Swain. Uh, they worked at DMBNB, a uh, great ad agency, Darcy Macy, Spend and Bowles up in St. Louis, and um, did a lot of Budweiser work. And so we had already done a lot of music for them. And uh, the story sort of goes that Michael had a frog, a um, uh, pet frog named Bud as a, as a kid. And um, they were a writer and creative director team, a writer and graphic design guys uh, team at, at Darcy. And they had an all call for the first humor spot uh, to ever um, uh, be done for the main brand of Budweiser. That's kind of unique. And uh, so we get called in you know, um, in early stages. And, and the creative team calls us and says, hey, uh, can you – uh, create a little audio track that has a um, uh, frog saying the words uh, Bud, Wise, and Earth. And so uh, I remember doing the original demo. I was the voice of all three, just as a demo, laid some crickets down. I lived on a farm at the time here in Tennessee, which is kind of <laughs> cool. Knew, had a little pond. I knew what it was supposed to sound like. So I was like, sure, I can do that. And so um, uh, we ended up uh, producing this little audio track, one of the first digital uses of the Mitsubishi X80 that we used Back in the day, uh, getting a little audio file, guys uh, that like beer there. Uh, so it was an early digital recording, and um, um, uh, Swain sent us a script. I remember this uh, vividly, and, and, and it had all the syllables on it. And it was like, this is crazy. And so um, <laughs> that's at a the short, end, of course, short the, script. <laughs> yeah, it's a real short script. We carried it around. It's got, you know, it's, it's very, the timing of it was very important. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, and of course, it ends up with Budweiser, and they take that and three pencil drawings that Michael had done of frogs. And they go into the agency, uh, I mean, go into the brewery and uh, meet with uh, uh, Mr. Bush, young Mr. Bush at the time. Uh, and um, it's the first comedy spot that ends up being the very first comedy spot ever run for main brand Budweiser. Let's talk about the the idea of the first comedy spot, because I think that's significant. Uh, certainly yeah. in hindsight, this is significant, right? But let's unpack yeah. what that meant at the time for you as an ad creative or as someone who's working mm -hmm. in the field. You had done other jingles for other brands. Um, had you ever worked on the Budweiser uh, brand before, or this was the first time? No, we had. We had done a lot of music. I uh, did a bunch of just tracks and stuff for them, uh, for Michael and Dave, same creative team, uh, just for different different spots, uh, you know, the bottle turning and some of the, some sure. of the hero things, sure. you know, Main brand Budweiser at the time was America's beer. Uh, it was very serious. It was what a father handed down to his son. It Clyde was all Stales. American. Yep, it was yep, Clydesdales yep. and proud and big and American flags and all the stuff, right? It was America's beer, like kind of like the Cowboys. Sure, yeah, America's team, sure. What does the audio look like for it before this commercial? I mean, you mentioned hero. I'm, I'm imagining swelling music. I'm imagining, you know, uh, big sort of Americana, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, audible, audi, audio themes. You can tell that I'm not an audio engineer. Help me out here. Give me the vocabulary. No, no, what? <laughs> no. no, it was. It was very heartfelt and uh, big heartland stuff. And, and, you know, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of orchestral music being done at that time. You had Rocky mm. and you had the Rocky theme and you had all this kind of stuff that was really bombastic and big and large and, um, heartland of America. That was the yeah. idea. Yeah. It, was, it was really about just putting your hand over your heart, having a cold beer and celebrating being an American. That's really what it was about. So there was a lot of humor in main brand, uh, items like Budweiser or right. main brand beverages. Other other brands would dabble in humor, whether this was at a CPG company 
just in general or at anheuser Bush in particular, you kind of do that with other parts of the portfolio, right? Maybe your younger brands or your off your spin-off brands that are only supposed right. to target a specific demographic. But to map comedy, to map humor onto the flagship, onto the standard bearer, that's a pretty big deviation in any company, and it's especially a big deviation in Anheuser-Busch, where Budweiser, the king of beers at this time, we're talking about the mid-90s, it was already starting, at least in the marketplace, to lose ground to Bud Light and to the, you know, to the other light beers. But in terms of its reputation, in terms of its gravitas, it was still just a really significant brand. So this had to be I mean, gosh, I got to imagine it's kind of daunting for you to be like, all right, the first comedy spot here, man, like it's got to be very, it's got to be really definitively Budweiser and definitively good, right? It can't just be a tossed off spot. Yeah, I want to make sure everybody understands that the agency would have dealt with all of that research and yep, all of that yep. with the brand. Um, I was with a production company down in Nashville. And so we got involved in a real peripheral way to begin with. And then, of course, I couldn't drink anything but Budweiser products and all that. But you're, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, Bud Light had a different agency. Bud Light was being handled by DDB Needham in Chicago. Yep. And so at that, t- at that time, and a, and a lot now, a lot of agencies will simply take a, one brand of a, of a company, someone else, because it's really about audience and, and how they drive message to audience more than it is how they sell products. So if you think of that, it's really the agencies hired for the for their ability to go reach audience. Yeah. And so, and we worked for those agencies and it was a lot of fun that way. But um, yeah, Darcy, Darcy had, had um, being right there in St. Louis, they've been the agency of record with Budweiser since its inception. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were the very first agency. And there were some rumblings, I think at that time, uh, if I remember correctly, of, of things not going well and uh, the desire of Bud Light for the, exactly what you're talking about, uh, Dave had had taken off with comedy and, and had a whole new audience, and yep. sales were going through the roof. And I think the the brand started looking uh, to move out of their backyard, which was just taboo. Man, you wouldn't even think about leaving St. Louis at the time. Uh, beer was all beer was done there. You know, that, that was the, there the center of the or, universe. Yeah, yeah, between them and Milwaukee, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's if, if if you if you tap into where where that's actually the beer was being created, so the agencies were there naturally. Yeah, and DDB Needham was in Chicago, and so they were doing Bud Light, and I, I still contend Chicago is the greatest ad uh, community in the country, um, simply because it's a part of the American culture, right in the middle. It's big city, it's big shoulders, it's heartland, it's all of that, and uh, some of the best creative done when creative really really mattered in advertising, mm. in my opinion. Um, it was coming out of Chicago. Chicago. Came out of Chicago. Gotcha. Yeah. So, it, so I think that 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 fueled a little bit. Sorry, that fueled a know. little bit to to drive um, some some movement in the main brand, and and I think allowed it that first comedy spot to come out. Yeah, right. Dave on. and Michael. Dave and Michael were funny. They were just funny guys. Yeah, and kind of quirky and 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 awesome ad guys. And so um, their spot rose to the top at Darcy. It got pitched. I think we produced late fall of 94 and um, the thing aired in a couple of off markets and then premiered on the Super Bowl. Wow. In 95. And so you were, like I said at the beginning here, you were the, you on the demo, you did all three frogs. Eventually yeah. you, you got the top spot as the bud guy. How many times in 1995, Tom, after the commercial aired, did you walk into a bar and someone was like, do the Bud voice, do Bud? Um, well, it really <laughs> happened after that because right when it was going on, nobody knew who it was. But yeah, it, I, it was amazing, dude. I had some crazy places people wanted me to say the word Bud. I, I was a deacon at my church in a servant communion. And uh, this lady, this was about three weeks after after the Super Bowl. And this lady looked up, up at me when I handed her the tray of the juice. And she goes, oh, Bud. And uh, I was just I was like, oh, my goodness. How sacrilege can I be? I thought I was going to get struck down right there. But yeah, it was crazy, man. It was crazy. I, I don't want to. I don't know how much you want to talk about that, but it was it was nuts being the voice of Bud. It still is. I'm sitting on a podcast in 2023 talking to you. Sure. And I feel like it was a kind of a cool card God allowed to happen in my life uh, that that I put in my back pocket. I don't have a shirt that says I'm Bud or anything, but. Um, it's been a great calling card. It's been a lot of fun. And, and yeah, man, I, we, we got toured around pretty good. We, I, I've worn a few frog con- uh, costumes at Halloween and uh, 
done a few things uh, <laughs> against the Miller girls at the time and might have been in a few competitions there. So, uh, yeah, it was great. Got to um, meet August Bush, which was really cool. And he took third? me around the office. Three sticks? The third. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he took me around the office like I was his pet dog or something and, and, frog. And, yeah it's like hey say it say yeah. it say it <laughs> right so it, it was great and and it, it, it kind of launched us as a jingle company into mm. a place um my voiceover reel says it took uh took this guy one syllable to break in the business <laughs> and uh actually it was my taft harley dave which was really cool from the voiceover side of things i was not a member of the union <clears throat> and you get a you get a first taft hartley uh, to not have to join the union to get paid union dues and all that. And so uh, I, it, it, it was my Taft Hartley and the lady at uh, the talent pay place said it was the, the best uh, Taft Hartley in the country. Uh, they played that. <laughs> those, they played those spot everywhere. So they, it was great. So they call it a Taft Hartley because you weren't in the union, but then you were able to get into the union because of that job. Uh, no, I've well, never yeah, heard that term had, before. Yeah. Taft Hartley, it was just the two men that put the, the Congress through, uh, oh, I know what through they, the bill through Congress. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, they, they, they say that you don't, that you can't force you to join the union to get paid for the first one. And then I did got a it, spot got it, got with it, got Reba, Reba McIntyre for Fritos after that and joined the union for that one. And got it. Got it. Did a bunch of other voice work for a long time. So the Taft Hartley is like, as a voice actor, like your freebie, your basically. Freebie. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a hell of a freebie. Like the, the lady freebie. said, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about the reception to the ad. I mean, I, you know, the, the yeah. ad comes into uh, comes into creation sort of late '94. Uh, it's testing in, in off, you know, in a few small markets, and then they run it. Um, according to William Noodlestater, they run it one A. Who wrote Bitter Brew, by the way, which is one of the histories of uh, Anheuser Busch uh, as a company. Um, this the commercial runs in the top slot in the in the the first you know commercial in game. Um, the first commercial break, um, and you know, you remember people sort of loving it. It sounds like, I mean, someone at your church, uh, says it to you over, over the, over the Eucharist, uh, over the communion, so to speak. Um, but it also received just a tremendous amount of critical, uh, uh, reception. I mean, it, it, uh, of praise. I mean, people, in the highest reaches of the ad world, loved it. I'm, I'm looking at just some stats here. Um, ad Age uh, reported that the frog, I'm quoting here now from, from Bitter Brew, quote, Advertising Age reported that the frogs had tripled the awareness of Budweiser among the, the target group of 21 to 33-year-olds, close quote. Uh, another quote here, the real winning team that day may have been the Budweiser Frogs, who outscored even the legendary Spuds McKenzie in USA Today's <laughs> weekly ad track poll. Ad track rated the Frogs number one for three months running, with more than 50% of poll respondents saying they recalled the commercial and, quote, liked it a lot, close quote. So, I mean, people are loving this thing as it's coming out. I mentioned Spuds McKenzie. We're going to talk about that iconic dog because I think that's a really interesting sort of foil here. Spuds McKenzie, of course, the Bud Light uh, uh, canine, uh, part, the, the party animal um, is what they call them. But people are loving this ad. It's it's reinvigorating, I think, Budweiser to some extent as a brand. Um what does this do out in the marketplace? You're obviously you you work as a jingle guy at this point, and you're you're in the ad space, but you're also a consumer. You're also seeing sort of how these things are playing out. Take us back, recall for us, if you will, what this does for the Budweiser brand from your perspective as a consumer. Yeah, I think it lightened it up a little bit. I think it made it available uh, to a whole new generation of Americans that didn't have to feel proud and. Mm old fashioned and heartland. And I think it brought it to the cities and again, added a bit of a smile to it. I think the coolest part about the ad itself that created uh, something um, in there, it was as simple. It was simply the name of the product. Yeah. Uh, so from a creative standpoint, I think it was brilliant on the, on the behalf of Dave and, and, uh, and Michael and then the crew at, at Darcy and then, <clears throat> and the campaign continued at Needham. And it just got wackier. If you remember, they jumped on a boat and boat rides and, uh, you got tongues stuck to the back of delivery trucks, and and there were know, the lizards uh, too, right? Louis the lizard. Uh, the lizards yeah. kept us alive for four years and tried to kill us <laughs> that whole time. So yeah, and yeah. that was created by Goodby Silverstein. So the lizards, that's a crazy story. So um, that was a whole other agency. Yeah, third agency involved. Um, wow. And, and 
So, and that's a great, great story. I'm not going to name names, but I'll name the agencies. DDB Needham had, so Darcy did the first spot. Yep. Moves to Chicago. Last spot that Darcy ever did for, for Budweiser. Uh, and, and Michael and Dave went, went on and continued to do some great things. I think Dave has an agency up there. Michael owns a restaurant or something, but I'm not sure exactly where they are these days, but in St. Louis, I know. And, uh, but the spots moved to uh, Chicago where Bud Light was and, uh, guys like Gore Verbinski, who did Pirates of the, uh, all the Pirates movies. Would go on to direct the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Yeah. He was, he was directing, uh, the, the, the TV spots. Wow. Stan Winston did the very first animatronics of the, of the original frogs. Uh, and he had just finished Congo and Jurassic Park. Jurassic I mean, these, Park. These were, yeah, yeah. these were huge people in Hollywood, uh, that, that the ad agencies kind of brought in, uh, with the dollars from AB, uh, we worked on the, on Warner brothers set out there. And I mean, it was amazing. Um, but, uh, when Needham got it in Chicago, they did about six spots and to be blunt, this is the way ad guys think. They were like, ah, I got a bud frog spot on my reel. I don't need another one. Mm. And they sort of, sort of felt that way a little bit. Um, and so agency, I mean, brand then gets a little, you know, itchy and they had a relationship with through Michelob, I believe, or one of the other brands out in, um, out in, uh, it could be Silverstein out in San Francisco. So they asked them to take a shot at what they would do. And they created the combatant lizards that continued the campaign for another four years of the battle between the frogs and the lizards and kept us in the Super Bowl. And as everybody knows, there was a big war between them and Louie was coming after us. And I've always wanted to, Dave, I think it'd be great. If you could make this happen, I would love to get all the frogs, the three voices of the frogs and a couple of voices of the lizards, and let's bring them all together and let's have a little dinner and, and, and put it on your podcast. <laughs> well, I think uh, that'd be fun. Let me ask you a question, Tom. Who were the other two frogs? Wise and Ur. Who were the other two syllables? Do you yeah, remember? Yeah, two of my good friends. We, we, oh, God, yeah, they're yeah. good friends. Uh, we, we worked together back in the day at the Jingle Company, and uh, the voice of Wise is a great guy named Ronnie Brooks. Uh, he lives here in Nashville, and he is... Uh, um, he's awesome. His brother wrote, grandma got run over by a reindeer. His <laughs> uncle was Foster Brooks, the old guy that used to fake being a drunk on the sure, Dean Martin show. Sure. And so, and Ronnie's a card man. He, uh, he played a little open house for us the other night. I saw him. He's doing great. And he's awesome. And Brian, uh, Steckler is the voice of Ur, And he may be the luckiest dude I know. He got, he was an intern for us at the production company. And the first three spots he got on, First one was his Taft Harley for Fruit Loops. Uh, he did a, uh, a Ford truck spot and then did uh, became the voice of Earl. My in, God, in the, the Midas touch. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah, he <laughs> was amazing. He and his wife sort of came from California, took Nashville by storm, and then he went back, and now he's a film produ- a film score guy out in L.A. and does great work, and they built a beautiful family. and Just two great guys, Brian Steckler, Ur, and Ronnie Brooks Wise. That's so, funny, man. Man, Ronnie Brooks crazy. also, what a pedigree uh, from uh, right? uh, humor music and show business. My goodness. <laughs> Comes from great. Ronnie, yeah. Ronnie was a guitar player. Yeah, wow. Ronnie was a guitar player. Still is and a great guitar player and, and played rock bands and all that. And he was a, a part of our jingle group. And we were just guys working at the agency. Yeah. yeah. And we just said, hey, come say why is like an old Jewish guy from the Bronx. And he <laughs> whines, whines. And so he did. And. Um, I said, Steckler say, er, and then the little one where he gets it, er, er, er. And so they put all that together <laughs> or we put all that together and mixed it with a bed of crickets. It sounded like my paw. And then we sent it back and there you go. Now, wait a second. Did happened. the, did the Foley, did the audio for the ad actually come from your pond in Tennessee? Were you just out there with like a boom mic, like getting the crickets? <laughs> do you remember? We did some of that. We yeah. did. We did do some of that. Uh, it, it became way overproduced. You know, you could have done it, uh, right. taking a sound design track or something out of there, but yeah, it was, it was really funny. And, and the, the funniest part is, we, we, we gave them the demo. It's a great little story. If you've got a second, sure. Um, we had a, uh, we did the demo, sent it up. Michael did the three pencil drawings. Uh, August bought the, the campaign and I get a call from Chan Hatcher, who is the producer at Darcy in St. Louis. And he goes, uh, Hey, thank you for the demo. We're going to go to LA and produce the voices. Mm. And of course you didn't know what it was going to be, but you're like, no, you're not. Yeah. We, <laughs> we want to be the voices. Wait a second. He's like, oh, well, We've got to go to Los Angeles to produce the voices. And so we were, I was kind of uh, a little bit, you know, uh, um, slighted, if yeah, you will. Yeah, that doesn't uh, feel good. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't feel good. So I, I, I get in my car and I go out and I talk to Chan and he goes, I tell you what, I'll let you produce it. You get to produce it, but and we're going to go to, we're going to go to LA. 
And so this is a, a cool backstory. He sent a DAT tape, if you remember what digital audio tape, this okay. little little bitty digital audio tape of 30 different auditions for each syllable. <laughs> so I had to listen through, but, 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 but. I yeah. had to go listen through that and wise, 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 30 times by 30 different people and pick. He let me pick the voices. And so he did. And you'll recognize some of these guys. I picked a guy uh, uh, for Ur. It was a guy named, um, uh, God, I'm going to forget his name real quick right here. Um, Roger uh, Mumpus. Okay. And he was a voice actor in L.A. and uh, did a lot of stuff. And then um, the guy I remember the most is I picked this guy named Brad Garrett. And Brad, who went uh, was just a stand-up comedian up, uh, up and down uh, uh, L.A., a, a budding actor at the time in 94, and uh, Brad went on to be in a bunch of, you know, uh, television shows, a big, tall comedian actor. He's, he's awesome. So I went out and produced those guys uh, at Soundwave Studio in 90, uh, 94. Um, had a big time, as agencies would tend to do when they'd go to L.A. And um, had a lot of fun. And, and, and at the very end of the session, after doing all this stuff with these real voice actors, I said, leave the demo up front to the engineer leave the demo up front. And he goes, okay. So I go have fun with the agency guys. We fly back to Nashville. <clears throat> Three days later, I get a thing. Hey, uh, we didn't capture the magic in LA. We Can we use the demo? So that's how we became the actual voices. <laughs> uh, by, by, uh, and so I, I, I think uh, Brad me- Garrett, I've never met Brad, but I would love to meet Brad someday. He might hit me in the mouth or something. I don't know. But he was really fun to work with. He was really a, 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 a great guy. I remember uh, in the session. And I, of course, a very talented man. So um, he's done okay. That's too funny, man. So a little bit of trade craft there to make sure that you're taking. Yeah, yeah. Leave, well, leave your demo on the front. That's leave your right. Demo on the front. Never know. Let that be a lesson to you, Tap Lines listeners. For anyone who's uh, going out for any voice work, uh, make sure that you're exactly. Tape- is up top. Of course, I guess now it's mostly files. There aren't really actually any data. Yeah, it's all files, streaming, all that. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Not many uh, dads, yeah. I've still got the original dat though. Do you yeah, really? Oh yeah, I've got. Dude, I got a box of stuff for you. We got a box of all kinds show, of stuff oh, for, yeah, you, if you well, want. for yeah, yeah, for, I, got, uh, I got show and tell later. For yes, later. please, please. Um, the uh, sorry, I'm lost my train of thought there. I'm just so fascinated by the dat tapes and that that uh, little movie <laughs> to, to make sure that you got that you got listened to and that you got uh, you got cast as the as the book. Yeah. Well, while you're thinking of it, I, and then after the spot ran. We heard it moved to Needham, so I got on a plane and flew to Needham and uh, met all the guys that were producing up there, and uh, they let us stay the Voices of the Frog. So we ended up uh, continuing to produce, and they produced all the audio from that point up at places called Cutters and different cool rooms up in uh, Chicago. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But again, it was um, just a real blessing, man, a real, real, real crazy blessing to, to be a part of all that. How did you – I didn't even ask this at first. Why – you just happen to be buddies with – uh, with the Darcy guys, like how? Why did why you? Why did you get the call? Uh, I Michael had been a creative director at a place. He and I helped create a place called Beach TV. Uh, it's a television network down on the coast of, of places. He had done a Panama City Beach. We started that, and then he moved and became creative director up there. I ended up at a Jingle House in Nashville, uh, writing and producing and selling music. And um, like I said, we had done a bunch of stuff for. Uh, for them, uh, music wise, yeah, and then yeah. Out of the blue, he calls like we we're being actually being a pirate in the studio when I got the call <laughs> for something, and he goes, "Hey man, can you make a, make a frog say Budweiser?" And I'm like, "Sure, dude. Why not? We can do anything." You know, I was selling it, and and then I went home that night, heard the heard the crickets, and it just all the stuff starts to happen, and then and then they um, too funny man working with Dave and Michael is just was was magical again, and then I ended up meeting Stan Winston and. Gore Verbinski and all kinds of crazy. Yeah, people. just these tight people who would go on. Or, well, I mean, Stan Winston was they already in his me. prime. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think yeah. he sadly passed. Stan Winston, I think, passed away a couple years ago. But uh, Gore, I think that's right. Yeah, Gore Verbinski uh, w- would go on to to do Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, Caribbean. Um, just like enormous amount of talent that is flowing through. Unbelievable. Creative, you know, ad creative at that time. Um, and I suppose a little bit, uh, these days, although my understanding of the ad business is that it's changed quite dramatically since 1995. Yeah. Um, but I, I, a lot. yeah, I don't want to dwell too much on the agency thing. Cause this is a little bit of like intrigue and cloak and dagger, but I do think it's worth at sure. least laying out for 
our tap lines listeners um, about sort of the significance of the move from Darcy to uh, DDB Needham up in Chicago, where, as you said earlier, you know, Chicago is uh, a epicenter, if not the epicenter of ad creative at that time. That's sort of the best stuff is tending to come out of there. Um, but you also mentioned that having local agencies, you know, that are servicing big American firms in, you know, your St. Louis's or your, you know, whatever, Houston, Texas or what, whatever, there were agencies that would spring up to do all of the work for these, these firms as they continue to get bigger and bigger at AB, it was for basically its entire uh, modern existence is my understanding. Um, Darcy had the, the Budweiser account. It was a big firm there, um, in St. Louis, there's sort of competing uh, tales about why Darcy winds up losing the Budweiser account. The one in, uh, bitter brew, nodal stater reports that, um, someone at Darcy after it got acquired by a New York agent, a larger New York agency, someone made the faux pas of signing a deal to do ad buying for Miller, uh, brewing company. So Darcy was going to have both the Budweiser brand, which at that point is reportedly around $125 million a year account. Um, but was also going to be doing, uh, ad buying for its biggest competitor, its mortal enemy, the Miller Brewing Company. And supposedly, again, according to, to Nodal Stater's Bitter Brew, uh, this infuriated uh, August Bush III, who, as listeners, you'll know from previous episodes with historian Maureen Ogle, author of Bitter Brew, and other guests that we've spoken to, August Bush III, uh, probably one of the more successful executives of his generation, um, a titan of American industry when that was still, you know, a term that was thrown around without irony. Um, I think he was also known to be quite a forceful and decisive man and was was felt crossed, felt double crossed. And again, in, in Noto Stater's account, uh, decides that this is this is time to make a break with Darcy. Um, does that broadly speaking, like resonate with you or ring true to you? Does that sound like how it went down to your knowledge? Do you remember any of that at the time? Yeah, I remember a little bit of it. Again, I was on the outside looking in a bit. They were all buddies of mine that I knew. Um, yeah. and so I've heard different sides of the story. I've heard that, that account for sure. Uh, I've also heard that that account was just the straw, you know, that broke, broke the camel's mm, back. Mm. Um, as far as they were already headed out the door, that was just a good last excuse to make it legitimate. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 you know, Darcy was the main flag, and then there were a ton of small agencies that did, you know, Bud Ice and all the off brands and all yep, the yep, little yep. Bush you know, one off yeah, experimental yeah. brands, Bush, all that different stuff. And then there, are, gosh, uh, Dave, as you know, then there's the infrastructure of production. There were the voiceover rooms and the the edit suites and the, all that that were in St. Louis and. It was really traumatic uh, when it happened. It was a really traumatic. A lot of guys lost their jobs. Yeah, a lot. totally. Uh, right. I mean, that's a the lot huge of guys, account. Yeah, yeah. Huge account, and 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 the peripheral money that was spent in the marketplace. A lot of firms closed. Mm. Um, a lot of firms split up. Partnerships broke up. It's amazing the the widespread effect it probably had on the. Uh, you know, I can't tell you where everybody is these days, but the widespread effect it had on the ad community um, that a brand can have like that on, on a city. And um, there, there, there were parts of, 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 of St. Louis that got bad because of it. I mean, there wow. were some warehousing districts that, so it's amazing the impact it can have. So whether it was the Miller buy and I've, I've heard that to be true or it was some other things brewing um, <laughs> before that. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah fair enough. Know, I, I think it could be a little both. Yeah. Let's talk about, let's switch gears for a second. I mentioned a certain canine, uh, a certain pup, uh, a little bit earlier in our conversation. Okay. Spuds McKenzie hits the airwaves in, I want to say 1987 or so. So it's about eight years uh, upstream of or preceding the Budweiser Frogs. 
And Spuds McKenzie, listeners, you have heard us talk about uh, this ruffian, this party animal, uh, as they called him, um, on, on previous episodes. For those that are not familiar, it's a uh, it's a bull terrier um, who is Bud Light's mascot. Basically, they come up with this idea to have a this you know the original party or the ultimate party animal. I think was his tagline. They dress him up in Hawaiian shirts. They send him down to spring break. He's surrounded by a bevy of of bikini clad women um he is a enormous runaway hit for bud light and bud light as a brand at that point is only in 87 is only five years old because it hits the it hits shelves as budweiser light in 1982 before being truncated uh to bud light in 1984 when you were you know producing the audio for the budweiser frogs ad this had to be spud spuds mckenzie had to be at least if not on your mind, I mean, it was in the ether at that point, right? Like this was a big successful thing that another brand had done. It wasn't jingle oriented. It wasn't, you know, sort of the, but it was comedy. Um, and were you thinking at all about Spuds and McKenzie when you were thinking about doing this animal comedy spot for Budweiser? Was that crossing your mind at all? Man, they like this. Maybe they'll like it if we do something like that. You know, I've only heard the stories of how Michael and Dave kind of came up with it. You know, I, I don't know if it, it, there's always competition inside agencies. Like what happens is a group of creatives will get together and they pair off and writer and, and art director kind of teams. Yeah. And then they come up with campaigns. Right. And so I, I don't think they were probably thinking about spuds. I really think it's something is, you know, everybody's tried to say, hey, it was designed for, to attract children. It was designed to do this. It was sure, designed. Yeah. I really, I really don't think it was any of that. I think Michael had a pet frog named Bud, and I think they were sitting in, in their office one day and said, I think it'd be a cool way to just say the brand. Yeah. And it really was the interesting piece of that. Here's a, and, that and that's why I say I don't think so. Uh, may have been. Dave may be on here tomorrow and go, oh, yeah, we had, we had a picture of Spuds up there and we're trying to go after it. Um, <laughs> But 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 I think I think you know that was done by De- by Needham up in Chicago. So they were uh, they, you know they had done Chester Cheetah and uh, they had done some some of some cool characterizations up there. And the, a, a unbelievable agency. So was Darcy. Um, but um, Needham was really 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 on fire at the time and uh, got, got I made some really good friends in Chicago. I lived up there about seven years. Uh, about that time, I, I went up there and started producing. We bought a got, bought a condominium, built a studio, did a bunch of stuff right right up there. So got to know the native guys really well, and they were really talented, really talented guys. And um, so I would say didn't exactly go after Spuds, but Spuds was definitely the lead duck, the kind of lead dog that uh, opened up animals and and some different things uh, to, uh, to to advertising. Uh, the funny part is is. The Bud campaign, the, the Frog campaign, was going to be. We, we produced a, a Jeff Beck spot. We produced a um, uh, a New York City traffic spot, and all of them in the in the noise you heard Budweiser, right, Budweiser. Right. So it was simply going to be the name that you hear in all these natural different places, and so it was literally like horns honking going, ah, oh, 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 yeah, Budweiser, Budweiser. And Times Square was going to have Budweiser. And then we had a Jeff Beck thing where he had this big Bud canister of helium um, stuff. And it was at a Jeff Beck concert. And he was on the stage playing this. And we had a Jeff Beck track playing. And you come around and uh, this is after the frogs had kind of gotten established. And it was the frogs sucking off the helium going, Budweiser, and uh, and you know, so it was all this crazy stuff of where you would hear the word Budweiser. So the frogs really weren't, hey, let's go create an animal campaign to do this. It's just one of those phenomenons. And then back to what you said when the super when it played the Super Bowl, it just I took off immediately. Yeah, I mean, it it was stupid. <laughs> but it, it was worked, stupid. man. It worked, dude. It was crazy. Tell me a little bit. I mean, you're in the audio profession. That's where you've made your career. Um, we talk a lot, I think, in this in this moment where TikTok is so powerful, right? And this idea of earworms, um, this idea of sort of sounds that just get in your head and stay in your head. Um, we mostly associate that with with music, with jingles, and that's the business you've been in. Budweiser, just the monosyllabic, you know, Budweiser, like everyone, you know, the the three frogs saying it, um, strikes me as, I mean, it's basically an earworm, right? Like everyone loved saying it in this sort of stilted, 
cadence with the low voice, the gravelly voice. From a technical perspective, Tom, help help our our listeners understand, or I mean, you know, just talk through a little bit why that it is as catchy of an earworm as it turned out to be. I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? You can't engineer for these yeah. things, but it's obviously something that worked. Why do you think the audio worked as well as it did? I, I you know, I think it was just so simple, mm. and it was something that you had heard so many times as a human being before, whether you'd been at a pond once or you lived next to one. Um, I think it was just something that everybody came, oh man, that is really clever, number one. And then and then it was just something that was, you, I, I don't know, it's just simple. I, I, I crazily have traveled the country talking about creativity and, and this spot. And and I think it's just literally the, the first spot I can think of that the natural sound of something that the brand name fit in like that. Yeah. And, and, um, and then, and then the frogs were cute and, um, they started doing funny stuff, driving boats and riding alligators and getting chased by lizards. And yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, man. I, I, I you know, I, I remember one of the things they did was as you opened the cooler door at a convenience store in the country, they had a little thing Speaker. and it would trigger you. Yeah, bud, yeah. Bud. And so, it just, it just one syllable again, it's just crazy. Um, but, but it was the name of the product. We all identified with it at the time and, uh, it was fun. It was really fun. I, I remember going to a, U- a university of Tennessee football game one time and the entire stand started doing it. And, and it was one <laughs> section, bud, wise, er, wow. I mean, it was insane. You wow. have a hundred thousand people yeah. doing that and you're like, and, kneeling, and my yeah, mother, yeah. my mother, Rest her soul. My mom used to th- think I was the frog. She, I was like, no, I'm just a voice. I, 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 I'm just a voice. Mom. <laughs> you know? it was, anyway, so it, it, it was. It just took on a life of its own. It was really, really unique. I've got a, I've got a thing back here. I don't know if you, I don't know if we can do that, but I can see it. But there's a little, uh, yeah, you see that audio there. But I'll, I'll take this over. It's a, it's a little editorial, and it says wide budget. Bud <laughs> says, Bud, Bud, why? Jit. Budget, why? Tax cuts, why budget? And that was done, and that was done uh, by Jim Borgman in the St. Louis, uh, no, in the Cincinnati uh, Explorer, probably back in 1996. So, and so, listeners, for those of you who are not watching on YouTube, and of course, all our tap lines episode are available on fine pairs youtube channel i recommend you go check them out but for those of you yeah. who can't make it over there uh what tom just showed us is a political cartoon riffing on the budweiser frogs but it's a uh it was about it looks like about congress like there it looks like they were trying to balance the budget this was the clinton era right of balancing the budget and whatever um so it had it filtered into the zeitgeist into like more serious ways right like this became a lens through which to tell stories about whatever you know politics or culture or social things were going on at that moment absolutely it became a part of cult cla- of the culture at, at the time there's no question about it and uh um we ended up on tv shows i was on the maury povich show with the greatest voices in the world and just i mean again <laughs> stupid stuff dave just only in america right yeah. only in america does that something like that take on a something of as insignificant and in, in really the overall scheme of god's planet um <laughs> that that only in America could that take off like that in a in a pop culture way, um, and, and and Budweiser has done a tremendous job uh, for many years of of creating ads and characters and and spokes things that uh, <laughs> that captured that culture at the time. Yeah, and this would later on, and this is of course well after the Budweiser fraud. Well, only about a decade as or a dozen years or so in two thousand like six or so, right before they get acquired by uh, InBev, which happens the hostile takeover happens in two thousand eight. Um, but in two thousand six or so, uh, August Bush the fourth is being groomed as the heir apparent um, to take over from Augie Bush the third. Three sticks. Uh, he's the next generation. Uh, he's got a lot of baggage in his past, but he's being sort of cleaned up and presented as, uh, this hot shot new executive who understands the young drinker, right. And, and can take us into the next generation. One of the things it cracks me up that, I mean, obviously hindsight being 2020, you knew this was going to be a boondoggle, but, uh, they launch Augie Bush, the fourth launches uh, bud TV and it's partly 
in in hopes of, or at least the thesis to the extent that it existed, is this idea that there is this this bud universe of characters, you know, that people love the frogs, the, uh, uh, Spuds McKenzie, um, the what's up guys, you know, like all of this stuff is content. Um, when we're first starting to, you know, as, as an industry, the ad agent, the ad world is first starting to think about content, right. As, as sort of, uh, stuff that you can put out there and people are just going to consume, um, and Bud TV was this this attempt by the company uh, to capitalize on its ability. It's I mean its sincere ability, its real ability to make important characters in American culture. It wasn't that they mm-hmm. weren't able to do that. That Budweiser wasn't able to do that, and Bud Light and and all the agencies they worked with, of course. Um, it the the project failed for a variety of reasons. One of which is that like creating a thirty second ad is a little bit different than programming a twenty four seven cable TV channel. <laughs> but your point is well made, Tom. That like they they've always been very good at uh at at, at creating sort of this cast or this roster of can- uh, characters. Like we have now the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like, but at a time there was a there was the Anheuser Busch Cinematic Universe. You know. It's crazy. <laughs> and who was the guy? Mac, yeah, Max Hedrum and all that. And with Max Coke. And, I mean, everybody was trying man. to do it. I mean, remember all those guys. I mean, that's, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was much more, uh, the Super Bowl was much more entertaining at that time. There's some good ads now. Mm. I mean, I watch it every year for the ads, but back then it was a really big deal to be on the Super Bowl. Let me ask and, you, um, Tom, I'm always curious about yeah. this. You're an ad guy. You've, you've yeah. worked in this field or adjacent to it your whole life or a lot of your mm-hmm. life, it sounds like. Um, yep. That's a common refrain, right? Like, oh man, Super Bowl ads used to be better, you know. And and I've I'm 35, and I say that I think that that's true. You've had a wider, uh, uh, you know, sort of lens on this. You have more perspective than I do. Was there more really gray like, hair? Too. Yeah. Well, you look. You have more hair in general, so congratulations on that. Uh, but was there really like was this the golden era? In ninety five ish, like when when did it peak? When it was in was Budweiser Frogs at the tail end of it? Was it in the middle of it? In your perspective, like when when was the biggest moment for the Super Bowl? As an well, ad, as the an Super ad, Bowl, real in, estate. in particular, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was definitely in the nineties. I mean, yeah. it was a big deal because people had had there had been enough really good ads going back to the nineteen eighty four and all the George, you know, the mm-hmm. uh, the, 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 the famous Major Macintosh, Green, ad. Coke. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, all, all those things that that had had come around in the '80s. So '80s and '90s were absolutely, in my opinion, were Hollywood's last bastion of of real mm. cinematography mm. and big deals and you know million dollar TV spot budgets and all that stuff. And um, which would be five million today, ten million today, right, easy. Right. And and so um, yeah, I think it was. Um, I, I think it's more of. I think the consumer changed that though. And I was in the jingle business. I got in it about 1984. Um, and stayed in it until about 2001. And uh, it changed when real music took over the jingle business. Mm. No longer did you write Heartbeat of America or write a big campaign. Some days were made for Michelob or uh, did somebody say McDonald's or all these, all these different things. Nobody was doing that. They were just taking existing music, doing a licensing fee, buying the equity in that song, putting some simple voiceover on it or not even putting, doing a voiceover to save the dollars. And then putting a uh, price and item and it was, let's buy, let's buy, let's promote, let's promote. Yeah, yeah. And not so much, let's spend a hundred million dollars and, and build a, a cultural piece like Budweiser. Mm-hmm. And it con- just kept doing over and over. I mean, there's no telling a billion dollars has been invested in the Clydesdales and promoting the Clydesdales. Oh God. Keeping it. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, it's gotta be, I mean, there's no telling what they spend to do that. So, I think brands started to see that you could have a, a music track and a voiceover and you didn't need to build a big campaign mm. or you could use the existing song revolution. You know, that's when the Beatles kind of started turning loose of their catalog and right. uh, real musicians saw that we were making a little money over in the jingle business and uh, decided to come jump in and, and, and the jingle business changed yeah. a lot, yeah. which then changed the ad business, the creative side of it. And then the consumer just went, I don't, I'm not going to stay with you that long. Like there's no reason that a campaign like Heartbeat of America should ever change, mm. ever. And yet the consumer says, I'm, I'm not going to stay with you that long. I'm going to go shop elsewhere. Then the agency is charged with, hey, go fix that. Right. Well, it's, it, you can't fix that with an ad sometimes. Right. And so that's a really that's interesting happened. point. Yeah. Hey, yeah. well, that, I think that's a good 
segue or an appropriate segue to one of the questions I want to ask you in, in our interview here is Budweiser Frogs, iconic, again, one of the best ads, considered one of the best ads, uh, Adweek called it, quote, one of the most iconic alcohol campaigns in advertising history. We talked before about how it tops USA Today's ad track. It, it wins all the, it wins a can, a war, a silver lion, a can, uh, a bunch of Clio's advertising, uh, Oscars, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> but you also have this sense, or I do, looking back at it as someone who covers the business contemporarily, that it is very of its era. And the question, for better and worse, the question I pose to you is, is there a place for that type of work in today's, in the, in the advertising landscape that you see today for beer and for, for other consumer packaged goods? Um. I'll say yeah. I'll say yes, because I'm a big message guy. Um, it really doesn't matter about the medium, in mm. my opinion, as much as the message. Now, I'm also older and, and really don't care about some of the mediums. So I've kind of, you know, I gave I gave up uh, social media for Lent a couple of years ago and hadn't gone back. But Good for you. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. Stay I'm, I'm off. A lot less stress. A lot less stress. It it's sounds great. amazing. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, do it. I, I, I recommend it every spring. Do, do, keep 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 re, redoing it. Um, but I, I, what I would say to that is the message I think would work. I think if you brought a spotlight Budweiser back, and my current wife would absolutely love for the campaign to come back. By the way, uh, uh, anyway, so I'm why did she? Is she a big honey. frog fan? <laughs> No, she likes the, the mailbox money, so she just would like to see enough. the mailbox money come. Fair back. enough. So I, 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 I get that. So, but, but, but all that said, put aside, I think I think a campaign like that would work. I think again, it would be in different medium. Uh, you would have it all over social. Um, you know, Will Ferrell does amazing work, and if you go to the a newer uh, campaign that he did about two Super Bowls ago for Old Milwaukee, sure, I it those was. spots were terrific. Yep. I don't yep. Know, you remember that where he's running oh, through yeah. the field oh, yeah. and all that? Yeah, they're well, great. Well, spots, think about yeah. what he did there. Think about what they did there. They did the same type, cool, fun, different, zany, a little bit of something. But he only bought, I think it's called Platte, Nebraska, North Platte, Nebraska. It's the smallest mark, television market in America. So they ran that spot on that television station, not on the ne- network of the Super Bowl, but right. they bought the Super the Bowl in North yeah, Platte. Yeah. Yep. The local, local, and paid. You know, I don't know what they paid for. A few thousand bucks, probably. Mailbox money. And they ran it. (laughs) Nothing, right? And then all of a sudden, they put it on social and it gets 10, 20, 30 million views. And it's, they call it the Super Bowl spot. Well, that is the new medium of how to do that. But the message and the the fun and the the creativity, I think, still lives as long as um, uh, we continue to create it or as long as the consumer's desires it and i think they do i yeah. think there's a, yeah right on i mean i think that. i hope that you're right and i think that I, I i think i buy that for the most part i think the challenge for me or the the stumbling block for me is like with the the consumer with the audience being so fractured in their attention span being so used to create yeah. to consuming content in two to five to 15 second maybe bits yeah. you know are the frogs themselves flashy enough? Are they, is there enough going? I mean, because one of the things I love about this spot is the Foley uh, audio, the natural audio is the, is the setup is the build, you know? And like it, it, it takes really powerful creative to get a viewer who's conditioned to swiping through TikTok, uh, you know, every mill, yeah. every half a, half a second to get them to buy into that ad. So I think it's a challenge. Uh, but as you say, like good message, uh, can still win the day, or at least we, I would like to live in a world where that continues to be true. So <laughs> we'll go maybe with that. Maybe I'm being wishful. Yeah. Maybe I'm having wishful thinking, Dave, kind of like you are. I don't know. We'll see, but, um, that's okay. Uh, that's yeah, what I do here on tap lines. We're allowed to, we're allowed to wish, uh, wish cast here on tap lines. This is my good. podcast. We can do whatever we want. <laughs> good. I like that. You know, and you make a good point. I think, uh, the nineties were a loud, uh, decade, very mm. loud decade, mm. a lot of noise going on. And so one of the reasons this thing probably did take off is you would hear a lot of noise and then all of a sudden you're, you just hear the crickets. Sure. And, and it was like, did the TV turn off? A what powerful happened? juxtaposition. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think, and, and so I think if you're, if you're playing social, just fast forward to today in the noise and the quick tick you, of just, just consuming stuff. Sure. Sometimes silence is very, very loud. And so I think, um, 
it could still work in that in that vein. Again, like you're saying, it's not a 30 second play. It's two, three, five, seven second plays. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it still works. I, and and I think um, creativity uh, in advertising is all about getting the audience's attention and making them make a decision. And so, yeah, I, I don't see why that couldn't work better. Right on, Tom. I have two more questions for you. Uh, you've you've come with us fifty one minutes on my little tap lines timer over there. We only keep wow. you for a few minutes more. Uh, you mentioned your deacon at your church, and after the ad airs, shortly after the ad airs, uh, you meet a woman in the communion line who gives you the bud uh, uh, treatment. Yeah. And then you also mentioned Maury Povich, where you're on as one of the best voice actors or voiceovers of all time, or whatever, the most iconic. Um, are there was there uh, are there any other sort of like shining moments for you? in the aftermath of being the bud guy that you were just like, this is, I mean, you mentioned that you feel like it, gosh, it's stupid. It's crazy. Whatever. Was there another moment where you were just like, what is going on here, man? This is nuts. Yeah. T- a couple really. <clears throat> um, the day of the spot aired on the Super Bowl. I had a party. I lived on a farm, like I said, out West of Nashville and, mm-hmm. Oh, uh, we had a party for about 250 people. And we served Eagle Brown Whoa. snacks and and Budweiser uh, beers. And we knew the spot was coming. And so it was a lot of fun to watch it with a bunch of good friends. And the phone rang off the wall during the second quarter of the game, just people saying, hey, it was cool. I loved seeing it. And so that moment when it when it first, the premiere night, if you will, you know, red yep. carpet night, it was really kind of fun. And we had a big, big party that night, big bonfires. And I remember watching the Super Bowl and, and seeing that come on. And I'm like, shh, you know, so that was a lot of fun. Um and then, and, and then I think as I toured the country, I went around to advertising clubs around the country and spoke uh, as the frog. And it was just humbling. It was humbling to realize that the, the uh, yeah, you know, and uh, and it was humbling to realize that people cared and that that's something that that advertising had a big, powerful impact. And so I really started, you know, turning toward thinking about impact more than I did about sales and uh, so mm. it started to change my life and probably work toward a long circuitous route to get to the lot of the work i'm doing now uh but i think i think i realized that that in that campaign more than any i've been a part of um the big impact that a, a good creative spot and a lot of air a lot of money spent on air um how, what it could do to a society and what it could how it could shape it and and then, like you said, to be a part of something that keeps coming back every Super Bowl is one of the top five spots at all time. Yep. It's just been really a, a humbling experience. Um, but, yeah, that, you know, and, 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 and um, I, 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 I'll, I'll relay this story. We got, to do a, we got to do a spot for the Frosty Frogs. I don't know if you remember that. No. There was one where the, the frogs had their tongues stuck to a bud can. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so yep, we yep. had to re-record. So we had to go up there. I'll tell a funny story on Brian real quickly. Uh, we had to go up and re-record in Chicago. So we were, I think, at Cutters again, and we went in there, and we had already gotten the takes they needed. And and, and it's so funny. We all get, a, you know, Ronnie had a capo from a guitar that he held his tongue with, and I had this little <laughs> breadstick thing. I, had, we, you know, we all were way overthinking the deck. I'm yeah, 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 held yeah. with our fingers. And so we already had the takes, and 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 I and Brian remember he was the rookie uh, voice of Ur, and I, and so I went over to the producer and I was like, "Hey, see all those row of snacks? I want you to make Brian put all that in his mouth and all these weird different combinations for the next thirty minutes and have him try different Urs. Can you do that? And just spit in the trash can. Let's just mess with it." And so they did that. They already had the Ur take. Yeah, it was already uh, done for yeah, thirty yeah. minutes. Oh no! So for thirty minutes we had Brian going on. Hey, take the peanuts and the and the right. gummy bears and put them in your mouth. Oh, that's oh, that's close, but that's not the texture. Yeah, oh, let's so try something else. Yeah, yeah, dude, it was great. And so just stuff like that, and just people you got to meet and places you got to go and competitions uh, against the Miller girls, like I said earlier. And that's yeah, it's just been funny, a, it's man. been a really cool calling card. Um, and then and then a friend of mine had a. a, a went to speak at an ad class at at one of the universities here in middle Tennessee. And he goes, he was telling them, Hey, one of my best buds is the voice of bud. And they're all in college now. And they were like, what's that? (laughs) And he goes, Oh, well, he's the guy that wrote the local convenience store jingle. Oh, oh, we know that. 
<laughs> so it, it kind of it gets past A after a while, Dave. So well, I appreciate you giving a darn about it still. I think advertise that's a good lesson that advertising <laughs> is context above everything else, right? Context. I mean, yeah, there you go. Exactly right. Uh, that's exactly right. I said I had two questions for you. That was number one. Number two is really more of a request for the tap lines listeners uh, tuned in. Yeah. And for, for me, for my own advocation, recall, or at least I do recall earlier in the conversation, you mentioned that on the demo you did all three syllables. I mean, you would go on to just be Bud in the in the final in the final track, but on the demo, it was all three. Would you uh, grace us with the uh, with a uh, reprisal of how this spot came to be? Give us the Bud Wiser, would you, Tom? Yeah, I'll try, and, I, and I'll, I'll I'll try to change voices in the middle of it. It's a little, little difficult. Put but, you on uh, the yeah, spot. I've done this for yeah, a while, yeah. so Dave, you caught me off guard. Yeah, um, I know. Feel yeah, free. This is real. This is real. Yeah, go ahead, Bud. Wise, err, yeah, bud. Wise, err. <laughs> bravo, bravo. I say give it ten Thank out of ten. The Tap Lines Ad Tracker uh, rates that as the best audio we've ever had on this podcast. So I loved it. I'm sure our listeners loved it. Tom Woodard, thank you so much uh, for for joining us today and taking us down memory lane uh, on one of the most iconic spots, uh, at one of the most iconic American beers ever produced. It's been a real treat to have you, Mr. Voice of Bud. You're welcome here anytime. Dave, thanks very much. Have a blessed day, brother. Uh, really appreciate the time and, and, and still giving a darn about it all. Hell yeah. Taplines is recorded in Richmond, Virginia and produced by yours truly and Darby Seaside, who, along with the talented Shane Farrick, composed our delightful soundtrack. Just listen to it. I also want to give a quick shout out to the entire Vine Pair team, and especially co-founders Adam Teeter and Josh Mallon, Editor-in-Chief Joanna Sherino, Managing Editor Tim McCurdy, and Art Director Danielle Grinberg, who designed our lovely Taplines logo. And of course, a big thank you to you, yes you listener, for spending time with us week in and week out. We literally couldn't do this without you. I'm Dave Infante, and I'll catch you next time. <laughs>